um, in terms of the structure, the structure of this workshop, I thought I would just um, basically, uh, uh, I mean, what, what I do is, is uh, travel around um, the world and, and, uh, and share stories um, in song about uh, current events and historical events. And, uh, and oftentimes uh, introduce them with some kind of anecdote that may or may not be related to the song because it's more important for the anecdote to be entertaining than informative. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then also a lot of stories from history are depressing and so it's also really important to make people laugh so that the songs that make people laugh might have nothing to do with current events or history, but it's important that they laugh in order to sort of get ready for the next bout of depressing stories and, uh, and hopefully leave the whole thing feeling inspired uh, in spite of the fact that everybody dies in the end of most of my stories. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, so I was thinking I'd just, I'd just do what I do um, and, and do it uh, for an audience of adults, which would be a bit different than the way I would do it for an audience of teenagers um, who might not have as many of the reference points and stuff. Um, and then um, I thought I'd do that for like an hour, and then and then the last half hour we could we could talk and uh, and you know Q and A or just comments or you know discussion or stuff like that. Or if there's any cover, any topics musically or spoken that I could cover that it, that you know that I didn't. Um, so um, yeah, and uh, start with. Start with very, very recent history. This is going back to 2012 uh, and the presidential debates. I turned on my TV, though it was hard to see these men who would be head of state. What a great country from sea to shining sea. We watched the Republicans debate. Newt stood with his third wife and said, you bet your life the president is a red. He wants to tax the rich a lot, take your limo and your yacht. He wants to have the bankers' heads. And if he gets in again, he'll paint the White House pink and then he'll hire Chavez as his VP. Then we'll be right on track to give capitalism the sack along with the insurance industry. If only it were true, if only it were true, I'd be so happy, wouldn't you? If only it were true, if only it were true, if only it were true. And they're all sing-alongs too, by the way. A sing-along is a song you've heard before, so they may or may not actually be sing-alongs, but... He'll give everyone food stamps and wheelchair ramps. He'll subsidize windmills and maple syrup. He'll cripple industries with eco-friendly policies, and pretty soon we will be just like Europe. He'll shut down oil wells, give out solar cells to every home in Delaware and Illinois. He'll ban logging in the parks, he'll send the works of Karl Marx to the homes of every American girl and boy. He'll abolish pesticides, he'll be giving out free rides and free lunches too in his high-speed trains. He'll start lots of public works full of union perks, he'll fill all the cities up with bicycle lanes. Yeah. If only it were true, if only it were true, I'd be so happy, wouldn't you? If only it were true, if only it were true, if only it were true. Watch out, his critics tell, this shall be our death knell. He'll pull the troops out and end all of our wars. He'll gut military spending, our empire will be ending, and soon we'll be invaded by the Moors. He'll legalize all drugs, give away beer mugs and hookahs to every child, and Korans! He'll ban religions from the schools, give 40 acres and a mule to every person who makes less than 50 grand. He'll close Guantanamo to torture, he'll say no, he'll make us all drive electric cars. He'll reinstate the fairness doctrine, turn off that damn flag pin, and he'll put Rupert Murdoch behind bars. If only it were true, if only it were true, I'd be so happy, wouldn't you? If only it were true, if only it were true, if only it were true. If only it were true, if only it were true, I'd be so happy, wouldn't you? If only 
it were true, if only it were true, if only it were true. So, uh, my friend uh, Dave Lippman says uh, what the, uh, that there was uh, before the Great Southwest was the Great Southwest, it was somebody else's Great Northeast. And uh, that's American hits history in a, in a nutshell. This is a song about the first, uh, the first war with Mexico in 1846. True story. My name is John Riley. I'll have your ear only a while. I left my dear home in Ireland. It was death, starvation, or exile. When I got to America, it was my duty to go. Enter the army and slog across Texas to join in the war against Mexico. And it was there in the pueblos and hillsides that I saw the mistake I had made. Part of a conquering army, morals of a bayonet blade. There amidst all these poor dying Catholics, screaming children, the burning stench of it all, myself and 200 Irishmen decided to rise to the call. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side. We marched neath the green flag of St. Patrick emblazoned with Erin Goldra. Right with the harp and the shamrock and the retired Palais Publica. Just 50 years after Wolf Tone, 5,000 miles away, the Yanks called us a legion of strangers, and they can talk as they may. But from Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We fought them in Matamoros, where their volunteers were raping the nuns. In Monterey and Cerro Gordo, we fought on as Ireland's sons. We were the red-headed fighters for freedom. Amidst these brown-skinned women and men, side by side we fought against tyranny. And I dare say we'd do it again. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. was the last. Overwhelmed by the cannons from Boston, we fell after each mortar blast. Most of us died on that hillside at the service of the Mexican state. So far from our occupied homeland, we were heroes and victims of fate. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. From Dublin City to San Diego, 
We witnessed freedom denied So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion And we fought on the Mexican side We formed the St. Patrick Battalion And we fought on the Mexican side Of course, um, you know, undermining those stereotypes and those uh, generalizations about uh, everything is, is our job, really. And uh, one, of, uh, one of the stories I always like to tell is about, um, uh, it, it, largely because it's true and it also undermines the, the stereotype that people in, in the West tend to have about uh, the Japanese and uh, it's a story about uh, my friend uh, Ben Mansky, uh, uh, the Mansky with the Plansky, a, a great organizer out in Wisconsin who uh, his, his grandfather um, uh, survived uh, Europe in the 1940s uh, because of a Japanese diplomat, diplomat named Chiyuni Sugihara, who is, who is now known in Japan uh, and taught in the schools there but in a really skewed way as a sort of a Japanese patriot. He grew up in Gifu, on the islands of Japan. He was sent off to Manchuria, that's how this tale began. His first assignment in the diplomatic corps was far off Lithuania and the European war. My grandfather was from Krakow. The Nazis came, he fled. He took his family to Vilnius so they might not end up dead. But the Panzers were advancing and he knew they had to go. But he had to have a visa and all the embassies said no. There was only one final possibility. The last consulate left open, the Third Reich's Asian ally. There in Lithuania, there was no time to lose. They came looking for a visa, thousands of Polish Jews. The diplomat called Tokyo, can I grant them this reprieve? Three times he got his answer, tell them all to leave. He looked into their eyes, talked to his family. He and his wife decided we must set these people free. Although I never met him, when all is said and done, I am Sugihara's son. Disobeying orders that they knew to be wrong, Sempo and Yukiko started writing all day long. A month's worth of visas in every 20-hour day. Sempo and Yukiko could turn no refugee away. Word came from the Empire, it's time to turn it in. You're closing down your consulate and moving to Berlin. They knew they did the right thing, of this they had no doubt. They threw visas out the window as the train pulled out. Although I never met him, when all is said and done, I am Sugihara's son. My grandfather crossed Siberia for five times the normal cost. Fearing for the future, with every minute lost, he got the ferry to Kolbe, then to occupied Shanghai. There he spent the war years, while back home his people died. Sugihara-san did not seek praise from anyone. When he died, the papers said his neighbors knew not what he'd done. But there are 40,000 people living lives today. Without simple Sugihara, I'd not be here now to say. Although I never met him, when all is said and done, I 
and so he had a son. There's, uh, you know, any, any number of zillions of ways to illustrate uh, the fact that democracy happens in the streets uh, much more than anywhere else. And um, I think uh, one, one of those, you know, zillions of more obscure illustrations of this is, uh, is the, what happened in uh, 1993 in Alaska when uh, it was uh, four years after the, the Exxon Valdez uh, spill and... Um, and the herring, uh, the herring had still not come back. And the, when the fishermen figured out that uh, with the life cycle of the herring, it was, it they had to wait four years to see what would happen. And, and when it was clear that the oil had still, it was still keeping the herring from uh, coming back, uh, the, they blockaded Pr Prince William Sound. And, um, and as a result of the blockade, which lasted for three days and nights, uh, the interior secretary of the US, uh, the Babbitt, I think was his name, he, uh, what was it? Is it? Well, he 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 negotiated with the fishermen to unblockade the the sound, and uh, and the and in the course of the negotiations, which were logistically challenging because uh, there was not a single boat in the town of Cordova that was not blockading the sound, so he couldn't get out there to talk to people very easily. But uh, in the course of the negotiations, uh, uh, he committed the federal government to spend one billion dollars on research into the toxicity of oil, which had never apparently been done up till that point. And so uh, what we know today about how toxic oil is, um, is known because of that blockade. And um, according to secondary sources, Ricky Ott's book, uh, one to, uh, not, not One Drop. Is, uh, I am a fisherman, so were my parents. Here in Cordova, on Prince William Sound, I'm not a tree hugger, but I love the mountains. And hauling in the gill net with the ocean all around, life was good here. You could raise a family with a hundred thousand tons of herring sent out every year. 1989, the tanker grounded. Nothing's ever been the same around here. Senator Stevens said, not one drop of oil would spill on Alaska's shores. And if it happened, it would be cleaned up. But our beaches were still covered, as was the ocean floor. Four years passed, each run collapsed. It was then we knew for sure the herring weren't coming back. Exxon's promises of compensation were about as empty as a used up paper sack. It was August 20th, 1993, when we fishermen decided something must be done. We packed some groceries, we made some banners, headed out to Valdez Narrows beneath the midnight sun. One hundred vessels took to the water Pushed through a storm and to the valley sea We lined up our boats, formed a blockade And we waited for whatever might be A tanker was approaching it was a sight to see there in the twilight of the day we saw it turning. We all cheered and cried as tanker after tanker after tanker turned away. A Coast Guard gunship from Seattle would take three days to get up to the sound. We held the line till then, then we went back. 
home to Cordova, to this hallowed oil ground. I am a fisherman, so were my parents. Here in Cordova, on Prince William Sound. And um, I don't know if you if you teach high school in Seattle or Portland, then uh, this next song is probably about some of your students and colleagues. And uh, and it's a uh, a song inspired by many ex experiences of being on the left um, in the world. And um, but uh, my favorite little anecdote um, that is related to the song tangentially is uh, a friend of mine from Hamburg, Germany, was on a march against nuclear power soon after the Chernobyl meltdown, and uh, she and uh, 200 people all together uh, were walking from Paris to Moscow over the course of six months, and uh, and they're traveling on foot, but they. Um, you know, but they but they have lots of stuff like pots and pans for cooking for 200 people, and you know people are carrying backpacks, and you know of course children get blisters and adults get blisters, and you know they get tired of walking, so they have a bus that's that's trailing behind them that's carrying all their stuff and the kids with blisters and whatever, and uh, <clears throat> so but otherwise they're on foot, and they're they're near the beginning of their walk, and they're camped out at a farm in Belgium. And, uh, and a number of uh, Belgian farmers, they were having nightly consensus meetings and, uh, for 200 people. And, um, you know, and I always say, if, 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 you, if you're wondering who the police informant is in your organization, then uh, whoever it was who suggested the nightly consensus meetings is probably the cop. <laughs> but they're having their nightly meeting, and, um, and these farmers come to their meeting, and they said, look, we support the cause. We're against nuclear power. We want to come with you all the way to Moscow. We propose <clears throat> that you leave your bus here, pick it up later, we'll come with you all the way to Moscow, and we'll transport the kids and the backpacks and all that with mule-drawn wagons. And uh, <clears throat> about 194 of the people walking thought the mule-drawn wagons were very picturesque and uh, media-friendly and um, e ecological and otherwise good idea. However, there were six vegans from Finland who blocked consensus because they were opposed to the mistreatment of the mules. and. Um, you know, of course, which, you know, got me thinking about being one who's also opposed to mistreating mules. But I was thinking, like, in the real land of real reality, um, you know, if you're a Belgian mule and you've been born already, you're working on the farm, you know, you exist, you know, and you're in Belgium, you've probably never heard of the buffalo or the concept of running free on the plains. You've never heard of the plains either. Uh, you know, this whole idea is, 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 you know, completely obscure. So if you're going to be in a densely populated country on a farm, you know, and, and you, you're going to be dragging that thing, thing back and forth anyway, you know, or you have the opportunity to drag that thing to Moscow and have a change of scenery, you know, I think with all respect to Finns and vegans, um, <laughs> the mules would have rather walked to Moscow. So. so I wrote this song in solidarity with the mules of Belgium, a, a much overlooked social issue. drive a car because they run on gas but if I did it did run on biomass I ride a bike or sometimes a skateboard so piss off all you drivers and your yuppie hordes sitting all day in the traffic queues I'm a better anarchist than you I don't eat meat I just live on moldy chives or the donuts that I found in last week's dumpster dives look you people in that restaurant I are so sad when you could have been eating bagels like the ones that I just had. I think it is a shame all the bourgeois things you do. I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't wear leather and I like my clothes in black and I made a really cool hammock from a moldy coffee sack. I like to hop on freight trains. I think that is so cool. It's so much funner doing this than being stuck in school. I can't believe you're wearing shiny shoes. I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't have sex and there will be no sequel because heterosexual relationships are inherently unequal. I'll just keep on moshing to anti flag and crass until there are no differences in gender, race, or class. All you brainwashed breeders, you just haven't got a clue. I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't believe 
believe in leaders, I think consensus is the key. I don't believe in stupid notions like representative democracy. Whether or not it works, I know it is the case that only direct action can save the human race. So when I see you in your voting booth, then I know it's true. I'm a better anarchist than you. I am not a pacifist. I like throwing bricks and when the cops have caught me and I've taken a few licks, I always feel lucky if I get a bloody nose because I feel so militant and everybody knows. By the time the riot is all through, I'm a better anarchist than you. I'm a better anarchist than you. So if you, um, if you travel around Europe, <clears throat> you'll notice, does anybody have some water? I really should have thought better about that. I brought CDs and no water. That was smart. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, that's plenty. If you travel around Europe uh, and you look, at the, you look at the government buildings and the castles, you will, uh, you will note the year 1849, uh, and, uh, which is you know, a bit interesting because a hell of a lot more happened in 1848. Um, but you'll, you won't see anything about that. But uh, 1849, you'll see like, you know, peasants got rights. Uh, we got a lower house of parliament. We got a constitution. Uh, you know, the monarchy became a constitutional monarchy. Uh, you know, all these kinds of things happen in all kinds of different countries. And of course, you know, as, as the history buffs here in the room are well aware, the reason why uh, 1849 is such a significant date for all these reforms is because in 1848, uh, a pan-European uprising overthrew every monarchy in Europe with the exception of Britain and Russia. And, uh, and they all came back to power, but in a very changed situation. And, um, and of course, the difference between people in the U.S. and people in Europe, uh, t one of the differences is that in Europe, uh, even if they may not know all the details, they know that 1848 was a significant year for a lot of things to happen. And uh, I, would, I would be surprised if more than 1% of the population in the U.S. is aware of this. But it was also true here. And, um, and of course, you know, I often, when I'm traveling internationally, I often um, make reference to Little House on the Prairie because this is a TV show that not only most people in the U.S. have at some point seen, but also very, was very popular. It seems just about everywhere. And, uh, and of course, it's depicting uh, the lives of small farmers. And, um, and, and of course, these small farmers exist, existed uh, you know, largely because of the Homestead Act, and the Homestead Act existed because of the rent strike, and um, and the rent strike ended in 1848 to a large well, it kept on going, but the, the, the mainstay of it uh, lasted up until 1848 in upstate New York, uh, when the farmers who were not small farmers, they were tenant farmers, uh, obviously a totally different thing, and um, and the landlords weren't people that owned a house or two, but people who, you know, like the banks today, owned most of the state. The patroons came from Holland to America, became landlords where none had been before. Soon one man owned half a million acres on both sides of the Hudson River shore. He invited families to move in and give him 30% of everything they grew every year. This is how they pay the rent. His name was Rensselaer. He became one of the richest men on earth. In today's terms, $90 billion is how much he'd be worth. All this for doing nothing but saying all of this was his. I have the power of the state behind me, and I'm in the landlord biz. After 200 years of this and one revolution won, another Rensselaer had another 
their son. And this Rensselaer was greedier than his ancestors dead and past. It was the 1840s and things were changing fast. It was the straw that broke the back the bottle was uncorked. They started organizing meetings. The tenant farmers of New York. They found the strength of numbers. They found the power of suggestion. They found each other asking the same question. Who gave you the right to be a landlord? To live a life of ease while others toil? Who gave right to be a rich man while the rest of us pay you so we can work this soil they vowed they would stop the rent collection they vowed they'd bring this madness to an end and when one blew the tin horn of distress he soon found he had a thousand friends with calico skirts masks upon their faces on horseback armed with knives and guns they chanted and they yelled and they kept their farms and they kept the sheriffs on the run they asked who gave you the right to be a landlord to live a life of ease while others toil who gave you the right to be a rich man while the rest of us pay you so we can work this soil Malicious tried to stop them, but nothing could be done to break their will. And by 1848, the landlords buckled, sold their holdings to the farmers in the hills. Yes, they overthrew this feudal system, but it's replaced now by speculators and banks. And you can hear, still hear the homeless families asking of all the landed gentry in our ranks. Who gave you the right to be a landlord? To live a life of ease while others toil? Who gave you the right to be a rich man? While the rest of us pay you so we can work this soil? Who gave you the right to be a landlord? To live a life of ease while others toil? Who gave you the right to be a rich man? While the rest of us pay you so we can work this soil? Who gave you the right? <laughs> So I was, uh, I was, I was visiting uh, a wonderful uh, uh, guy who maintains this tradition of singing songs about what's happening in the world, Tommy Sands, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, and he was saying that the uh, I watered my guitar. He was saying that the <laughs> it's kind of like plant. You know, it's made out of wood. And, um, he was saying that. Uh, the, the local town council there in, in Ross Trevor uh, wanted him to write a song because he's well known for, uh, you know, he comes, comes out of the, the Republican community there uh, in, in the north of Ireland, but he, uh, he, he's well known for being uh, a big proponent of reconciliation and uh, the peace process. And, and, uh, and they were wondering if he would write a song about uh, a... Uh, basically a, a very wealthy Protestant military general. And, uh, and that was just all a bit too much for him to consider. And, um, and so he, he you know, was talking to me about it. And I, and I had been thinking about writing a song about this guy for a long time, although I, I didn't know he was a rich Protestant military general. I, I, uh, I, knew, he, I, I, knew, uh, I knew him for having been uh, involved in the War of 1812 and for having burnt down the White House, the Congress, and the uh, Supreme Court, uh, you know, in 1814, on August 24th, and uh, and of course the War of 1812 didn't just happen in 1812, and uh, and of course it was not just a number, it was a war that happened because the U.S. invaded Canada, in an unprovoked invasion of Canada, and. Um, uh, having uh, perhaps believed uh, a little too much of their own propaganda about how popular the American Revolution was, uh, the American Revolution being largely a war between France and Britain, which France won, and uh, all the arms provided by the French and uh, most of the soldiers. Uh, but we, that's not how it's taught 
of course, and uh, and by by a gen by a pan Anglo agreement, uh, we, we we all don't teach it that way because the French don't win wars. You know that's not acceptable. Uh, that's uh, that's for the British or at least the Americans, but not the French. Um, but. Uh, but I, you know, I, I was uh, in Ross Trevor, and there was this monument to uh, General Robert Ross, and I thought, well, you know, despite his uh, his his unsavory background, uh, I, I thought I, I could give a go at writing a song. Because not only did he burn down the White House, the Congress, and the Supreme Court on the same day, but he ate the president's breakfast before doing so. And uh, I think I did not manage to work that into the song, but. Robert Ross was from Ross Trevor. He was born in County Down. His family was given land there by the British Crown. He was a man born of the gentry, born with wealth and fame. But he joined the British Army to serve his queen and make his name. In the Napoleonic Wars, he fought in many lands. In Holland and in Spain, in the far off Egyptian sands. He was wounded there in battle, came back to fight another day. And he was sent off to attack the USA. York had been sacked and burned by invading Yankee men. But the Canadians regrouped, chased the Yankees home. And then the British Navy made its way to the shores of DC town, where General Ross burned the White House down. The year was 1814, the U.S. was in retreat. It was a Canadian victory, an American defeat. Without the French to help them, they got their ass whipped by the crown when General Ross burned the White House down. The place had just been constructed only 12 years before, but it had to be rebuilt soon after this disastrous war. The president turned tail and ran like a raggedy clown when General Ross burned the White House down. He was killed a few months later. Irish rebels stumped with his tracks. He was buried in Nova Scotia in the town of Halifax. He might have been forgotten, but he'll forever be renowned. He's the man who burned the White House down. He's the man who burned the White House down. I'll uh, do, a, do a little more recent history. Um, I'm doing a, doing a seven-part series on my uh, Spreaker channel on the internet uh, tomorrow morning, uh, starting tomorrow for seven different segments on, on history and song, um, which will be a lot longer than this workshop. And, uh, but, um, you know, uh, things, things happen that, it, it, you know, you got to say something about. And a uh, nice thing about any form of commentary, whether it's a song or, or any other kind of thing that you might be writing or putting out there is uh, if you're if you're writing about something that is in the news and will continue to be in the news for some time uh, then it, it, people are going to pay a lot more attention to it doesn't mean it's going to be any better than uh, something else that you might have written but uh, that's how it goes so having learned this years ago I was uh, very excited when the NSA spy scandal started uh, to break because I knew that this was going to be something like Chelsea Manning it was going to stay in the news uh, because for obvious reasons, it's so much, uh, so many revelations uh, constantly coming out at the most wonderfully inopportune moments. You know, uh, I mean, I love it when uh, you know, Obama's just about to have a meeting with uh, the president of uh, Brazil, and then comes the revelation that he's been listening to her cell phone conversations. You know, uh, you know, the day before she's about to leave. So. Uh, Glenn Greenwald said that he was going to get him back for uh, taking his boyfriend hostage, and uh, I think that might have been retribution. I don't know, but maybe the timing was coincidental. You know. A secret 
secretive government had a secret operation, massacring villages, killing millions, secretly bombing an entire nation. They wiretapped a hotel room, got caught, and the government was deposed because of secret documents Daniel Ellsberg exposed. One government came down to prevent a repetition of this fact. The next government passed the Freedom of Information Act. Each administration since then hoped it would go away, and then they finally seized the chance on a September day. They passed the Patriot Act before a single congressman had read it. But don't ask the executive how they interpret it, because that itself is secret, never to be revealed, just like their secret prisons and all the torture sessions they conceal. Then they formed the prison programs so they wouldn't even have to ask compliant corporations to assist them in the task of collecting information. Every email you ever wrote, every book you ever read, every call you ever made, everything you ever said. I looked into a prism. What did I see? A police state looking back at me. The secret government men lied to congressional committees. Secret information even a senator can't see. Secret bureaucrats working with secret corporations, enforcing secret laws, forming secret juries to serve a secret cause. I looked into a prism. What did I see? A police state looking back at me. One brave man came forward and then he fled town. And now the secret government men mean to hunt him down. Feinstein says he's a traitor, McConnell said so too. But I'd say if we have a future, it's because of the whistle that he blew. I looked into a prism. What did I see? A police state looking back at me. I looked into a prism. What did I see? A police state looking back at me. I thought, um, actually, the president himself uh, summed up the whole Trayvon Martin thing very well. And he was made that speech soon after the verdict. And uh, But I think uh, the thing I, one of the things I really like about songs is that every song that you write is potentially a meme that can spread, and, um, and it works better than speeches in terms of its meme qualities, you know, as, as a little three-minute piece of audio, because they, it actually works well with the, the internet age uh, when everything is supposed to be short, you know. Songs are short. Uh, at least they don't usually get accused of being long. Unlike if you write an essay that's more than two pages, they accuse you of writing a long essay, and I don't understand these definitions necessarily, but. A boy went to visit his father out of town, where he had moved to an upscale neighborhood. It rains a lot in Florida, and it was raining on that night. But everyone says exercise is good. He went out for a walk to the convenience store to go out and bring some candy back. Some people leave and they never come home, and that night it was a one-way track. For the neighborhood watchman was riding in his car on a rainy night looking for a young man who might have a part to play in his personal race war. And what if this trolling vigilante, sowing terror on a racist whim, what if when he found this teenage boy, he instead had found a man more like him? What if things were different? Where would he be bound? What if Trayvon had stood his ground?
When Zimmerman approached in an unmarked vehicle When the high school student ran What if instead he had stood there in the rain With his Skittles and his Arizona can? What if trying to avoid a conflict with this cracker Who was evidently messed up in the head Trayvon had said, I feel like my life's in danger And he had shot this vigilante dead What if things were different? Where would he be bound? What if Trayvon had stood his ground? Would this hooded youth be gingerly arrested, treated for his wounds and then let free? Would he be hailed as a hero by the NRA, by Limbaugh, Beck, and Hannity? Would he be found not guilty by any jury in this country? Would he be allowed to keep his gun? Or would he be sitting in a prison cell watching pundits on the TV saying, that kid really should have run? What if things were different? Where would he be bound? What if Trevon had stood his ground? Maybe I'll, I'll do a couple more songs and then we can talk, perhaps. And then, of course, I can always sing, you know, if there's nothing to talk about. But there's, uh, you know, I think one of the greatest things about elections is the entertainment value. And, um, <laughs> and uh, we had some pretty good ones uh, in recent months. But I think Anthony Weiner has got to win the prize. <laughs> Wiener takes pictures of his wiener and sends them off to lots of women that he's never met. I normally wouldn't care about some guy's pubic hair, except in this case it's a politician we can hopefully soon forget. He wants to make New Yorkers proud and show he's very well endowed to be the mayor of the city from which he sends his tweets. He's a good Democrat. He'll go up to bat for the people of New York and the random women that he greets. Anthony Weiner's wiener these days, it's all the rage. To find out more about his wiener, just take a peek at the front page. I probably wouldn't give a shit about his adolescent wit, whether he was sexting after he resigned from Congress or before. I don't, uh, I may not like his style as he issues his denial, but what really bugs me is he voted for the war. Anthony Weiner's wiener these days, it's all the rage to find out more about his wiener just take a peek at the front page now that it's the second scandal maybe we can pull the handle and send anthony and his wiener down some flushing drain and await the politician next who will send a penile text one vile politician down but far too many still remain anthony wiener's wiener these days it's all the rage to find out more about his wiener just take a peek at the front page So I'll do my, uh, my, my pedagogy of social change in three minutes, and uh, I think, um, I think that, you know, the, the biggest question that people ask every, all the time, everywhere, is uh, when things are so messed up, why aren't there more people doing something about it? And I think the answer is very simply um, that you need to not just have the messed up conditions, but you need to have a large group of people who understands the power of collective action and also has the optimism to believe that if they engage in collective action, they can change everything. And all that needs to be there, you know, uh, especially that last part. And, um, and so having attended many conferences uh, where the overall message of the conference uh, was just what I just said, except in much more detail, I thought um, I, can, I can boil this down to three minutes. And, uh, and, and then maybe that'll convince them to have more music at conferences, you know, because... Uh, yeah.
which not not that I'm this this one's great, but it's it's uh, the Marx. I, I was at a Marxism conference in London, England, a few a couple months ago, and uh, and they and it was it was a conference, but they actually build it as a festival, and uh, you know there's conferences are great, and there's nothing wrong with that with having a conference, but if you're going to build it as a festival, then your you know, then you're, you're, you're sort of upping the ante there. I mean, that's, you know, then you are, you are committing yourself to, have a, to having a, a majority of the event being of a cultural nature. Otherwise, it's really not a festival by the traditional definition. There, there needs to be music, theater, film, uh, poetry, you know, whatever, things like that. That's what a festival is, as far as I understand the, the term, and I think most people understand the term festival. So uh, they called it the Festival of Dangerous Ideas, and it quickly became uh, nicknamed the, uh, the, the, the Conference of Harmless Notions. But, uh, <laughs> but it was, uh, they were good ideas. They were, they were good dangerous ideas, really. But, but uh, the, the, there were two musical events at this festival, and they were both receptions. Uh, so they were both not in a theater like this. They were in a sort of loud place while people are drinking and talking. And nothing wrong with people drinking and talking and listening to music in the background, but if that's the extent of your cultural, uh, you know, uh, component to the festival, then uh, it's, it's a bit lacking. But the most, uh, the most sort of entertaining in a, in a really bleak kind of way was that it wasn't even music that they had as background to this reception. It was some of the best poetry ever written. A, a woman named Rafis Ziada, who lives in London, lived in Toronto for many years, a fantastic Palestinian poet, to, uh, doing incredibly powerful stuff about her own personal experiences with, with you know, nice light subjects like racism, sexism, and xenophobia. And she's doing this amazing poetry while you know, a, a predominantly white English crowd is drinking and talking and ignoring her. And um, pissed me off. <laughs> isn't hard. The second step is everybody realizing they're like you. They're holding the same card. Step three is finding there's a tactic when everyone believes it could be true. That all the people work collectively, there just might be something we can do and everything can change. So quick. Businessmen and TV sets will try hard to make sure it isn't so. You don't have a problem. And if you do, it's not the same problem. And if it is, well, there's just nowhere you can go. But it's happened many times. The history is rich, though we easily forget how a meme can take hold and grab you, how it can spread out like a net, and everything can change. So quick. We're dreaming or they'll make a dream for us. They'll try to come up with a good story about why we belong at the back of the bus, about why we belong in this position, about how we don't know what we meant, about how there most certainly isn't any such thing as the 99%, but everything can change. So quick. Everything can change. So cool. 